Hi, I'm Jess. Hi, I'm Kristen. And this is Rediscover, a conversation where we travel through everything that makes up the essence of who we are and how to live authentically and imaginatively. Here, we invite you to join us as we explore and discuss a little bit of, well, everything. From Disney to cultivating your most authentic life to deepening your relationships and talking about the real stuff. We hope you'll find this a space that speaks to you, encourages you, and brings a little bit of magic into your day. Hi everyone. Before we get into this week's episode of Rediscover, we wanted to take a moment to let you know that the following episode was recorded before we heard the news of the impending Disney layoffs for over 28,000 cast members. This of course affects both of us personally, whether we have been laid off ourselves or we are witnessing members of our cast member family experiencing this devastating loss. We're all heartbroken for ourselves and for each other, and it's a lot to process. It's happening really fast. We've been given some very vague, minimal context. But I think what's important to focus on right now is not who's getting laid off and who isn't or the numbers. We need to focus on unity instead of division, on what brought us together in the first place. This is happening and we can't do anything about it. There's just so many outside external circumstances. And we understand at the end of the day, Disney is a business and they need to make decisions that are best for them. However, what we can do is we can choose how we respond. We can choose to be there for each other. And we just have to remember that at the end of the day, we are a chosen family. This family is comprised of people from all over the world, from all different backgrounds, and we really are a group of people who found our chosen family amongst each other. Whether we didn't feel accepted in our hometowns or we didn't have the best family life, we found community at Disney. We all built personal networks out of real personal bonds and felt accepted and celebrated, some of us for the first time ever. When families go through hard times together, it often deepens their strength and their bond with one another. The way people have come together to reach out with kind words, messages, and support has been so meaningful to every one of us who has been going through this difficult time. For those who are still working, we totally understand how you might have a sense of displaced guilt surrounding still having a job and how hard you're working to continue to help Disney to keep moving during such a difficult time in our world. But the important thing to remember is that this is not your fault that this is happening. None of us has any control over this situation. And at the end of the day, we only have control over how we respond, how we move forward, and how we come together during this time. So if you were affected by this, whether you decide to stay in Orlando or Anaheim, or you move anywhere else across the country or the world, Just remember, the magic that made you love this place is truly inside of you. The things you will bring to the table in your future roles and locations in your life will truly be special because of the relationships and the skills you acquired at Disney. Our cast member, Light, now has the opportunity to be spread all over the world through you, and it will brighten up some dimmed corners that needed a little boost of extra magic. It's so important to... Feel all of your emotions. Really allow yourself to process and sit in this moment the best way that you can. Allow that spirit of magic to lead you wherever you go next and know that this isn't the end of your story. Above all, at the end of the day, Jess and I are here for you. We are here for each other and we want to help provide support and care in any way that we can. We hope that You can keep the magic alive and stay in touch with your Disney family no matter where you go. We are all connected by this place and these experiences that we've had together. We all share something truly special. So if you were affected by this, we are thinking of you. Feel free to message us anytime if you need a little extra support. That all being said, we'll move on to today's episode and we hope you enjoy it. We love you guys. Hi there, I'm Jess. Hi, I'm Kristen. And welcome back to this week's episode of Rediscover. On today's episode, we are diving deep into the dynamic Disney couples. 
specifically focusing on the Disney princesses, and we are going to take a look at all things to do with their dynamic relationships. We'll talk about things like what each person brings to the table, how they interact with each other, why their relationships work, and some of the hardships they face and how they come through them. We can take a look at these relationships and see how they parallel those in our own lives and what we can take away from them. Also, this topic was submitted as one of the suggestions by my good friend Kat White. She has a really cute dog named Rumple. Rum- oh. Rumple Deary on Instagram if you want to check him out. He's a little King Charles Spaniel and I love him. All right, let's get into it. My first choice is the controversial and often misunderstood relationship between Belle and Beast. Belle and Beast are very, very near and dear to my heart, and I am an avid Beast advocate. I think he is often very misunderstood, and I think there are a lot of obvious hesitations, especially for little kids where he's concerned because he's really big and tall and furry, and sometimes he can be kind of scary, but there are a lot of misconceptions about Belle and Beast's relationship. People have made comments over the years about Belle possibly having Stockholm Syndrome, which for those of you who don't know, is sort of a psychological syndrome where you fall in love with your captor. If you look at the entire story and begin with who Belle really is, she is someone who is always thinking outside the box. She has a different perspective from most people in her village because she thinks a little bigger. And I think in doing so, she's opened herself up to loving people that the world has kind of cast aside. I think Beast has that same capability, but if you take a look into his past, he suffered a lot of tragic loss and a lot of heartache and that caused him to kind of develop this callous outer shell. In doing so, he forgot how to love others as his mom had loved him. And then when he met Belle, I think their souls sort of collided. I'm gonna get a little sappy here. <laughs> They're both different. They're both often misunderstood by the people around them, but they connected because of that. And Beast was one of the first people to celebrate what made Belle different when he gave her that library. I mean, who doesn't love that moment? <laughs> Truly, that was the moment, I think, that made everyone realize that he sees her. You know, she kind of started to sort of look at him differently too. I think Something There was a very well-written song that sort of catalyzes how that relationship was evolving. But I really think, you know, Beast had to unlearn his conditioning to act selfishly and out of entitlement, especially after he felt the loss of his mother so severely. And Belle being so patient and understanding and humble, she really shone a light on Beast's negative behavior and made him want to be different because he was so infatuated with her ability to see the good in him. And she wasn't afraid to stand up to him, which I think he also liked. You know, she really brought a bravado that was very unlike women of her time. They both did these really altruistic acts of bravery and love. That whole concept that the film begins with when the narrator says, for who could learn to love a beast, that's almost a challenge for us. We walk through life with a lot of preconceived notions and judgments about people who maybe don't look like us or don't speak like us or don't act like we do or believe what we do, but she fell in love with who Beast was. It has nothing to do with his outward appearance. And I think that's where people kind of get tripped up with Bell and Beast is they focus solely on what he looks like on the outside. There were plenty of challenges in their relationship, beginning with the very nature of how it came to be. She was held captive in his castle what they each brought to the table was a true knowing and understanding of who the other person was and a celebration of the fact that they were both different i think bell and beast are such a special couple to both of us and i loved that analysis thank you for diving so deep into it <laughs> when i was thinking about everything that makes this couple so wonderful is that allowance is their success story meaning that their love for each other cultivates an allowance or a permission for the other person to be exactly who he or she is. When Beast let Belle go, he did so because his love for her was greater than his selfishness. One of the best qualities in a relationship, I believe, is when both people are truly allowed to be themselves and then they come together as a team. 
All right. So that was a beautiful start to this episode. So the next couple we are going to discuss today is Aladdin and Jasmine. Aladdin is a movie about the unlikely story of a street rat and the princess of Agrabah. The two of them are clearly intertwined by fate after their initial chance meeting. They just kept running into each other, couldn't stop thinking about each other. It was like they had known each other before. Aladdin even used his wishes from a magical genie to pursue this girl he had really only met one time, but something inside of him just knew that she was meant to be part of his life path. The two of them bring so much to the table. They are both, I think, incredible characters. I've spent years of my life just admiring the two of them. It's not what's on the outside, but what's on the inside that counts, which is similar to Bell and Beast like we were just talking about. Aladdin, he may be doing things like stealing and lying. He really does have a pure heart and pure intentions. He just you know, is trying to get by. Another really great quality about him is that he's incredibly street smart and skilled. So physically, he can get himself out of almost any situation, which I think is a really great quality to have. And then when it comes to Jasmine, she's very strong willed. She's very intuitive. I think she knew that there was something more for her than just getting married at 16 to a prince. She knew that she wanted to marry for love and she wasn't going to settle for that. And I think she knew she had this inherent knowing that her worth was bigger than the fates everyone was deciding for her. She knew she had more to offer to her kingdom and herself. And ultimately, it's really like a self-love story. It really is. And she wanted to see the world. She wanted to make new friends. She wanted to see what was past the palace walls. And because she stuck to that and didn't just go by the rules, she was able to open up to a whole new world and, you know, welcome someone into her life that truly did love her. Clearly, she saw Aladdin for who he was, um, regardless of where he lived or what he looked like or what he was wearing or what he was doing. And she's also very good at adapting to situations and she's very quick on her feet, such as, you know, being Aladdin's crazy sister in the marketplace with the camel (laughs) or um, seducing Jafar when she needed to distract him. The dynamic of their relationship, I very much view the two of them as a team. He had access to a magic carpet and he took her all around the world in one night. He took her to Egypt and China and saw fireworks and... And the really cool thing about both of them is that they both really step up to the plate when it comes to each other. When Aladdin married Jasmine, he was stepping into the role of becoming Sultan and standing up alongside her to rule the kingdom. And that takes a lot of bravery. I think some of the challenges they face were they had to take away the labels and they really just saw each other's hearts and In doing so, the laws worked themselves out. Things just ended up working out because they didn't go by what society was telling them that they were. I think one other huge challenge they had was overcoming Aladdin's constant lying, (laughs) which I really hope they worked out in their marriage. (laughs) They were white lies, but, you know, he learned, like, lying catches up to him. He really had to realize that he couldn't pretend to be something that he wasn't just to win Jasmine's heart. She loved him from the moment she met him. Ultimately, I think their relationship works because they're very dedicated to each other. They were both highly evolved individuals before meeting each other. They both had a desire for more, though, and their journey is really aligned in that way. One of the main reasons I think the relationship works goes back to that quote, do you trust me, that he says to Jasmine multiple times, um, And I think that really goes down to the point of they both take big risks in life. He's like, do you trust me? And she says yes. And when they jump together, they were able to take those risks and trust each other and move into that space together. First of all, what a date. What a first date. That was a first date. What a dream. Magic carpet ride across the world complete with fireworks. Yes, please. (laughs) What you said about him stepping into the role of sultan and him working through his tendency to lie go together those are both two things that really align with authenticity and allowance and him feeling like because of his class difference aladdin probably felt this inherent indoctrinated shame for who he was and unworthiness too yeah because that's probably why he lied he probably felt mm -hmm. like he was not worthy 
exactly. to be with Jasmine. He wasn't worthy to be with Jasmine. He wasn't wor- worthy to become Sultan. So this lying was really just a protection he built around himself because it's so hard to let people in and let them see who you really are if you are ashamed of who you are. He's not lacking in confidence. He he knows that he's resourceful and quick and learns fast, but I think he needed Jasmine to love him for who he was. Yeah, I think they really were like partners in crime, compatible, like best friends. And I think that's a lot of why their relationship worked. My next couple is Ariel and Eric. And I love them so much. They're often misunderstood. And I think a lot of people don't realize how much depth there is to their relationship. And even I assigned more shallowness to it than the other couples I chose. And then the more I started diving into it, I realized, oh no, there actually is a lot of depth. There's a lot to explore here. So was that a water pun? Depth and shallow? <laughs> actually, no, but you being the Jungle Cruise skipper <laughs> at your service. I actually didn't even realize I was doing that, to be honest with you. But That's you perfect. you can take the dress out of the jungle, but you can't take the jungle out of the chest. Correct. Anyways, <laughs> go ahead. I'll try to be more cognizant of my ocean puns. However, there is an intentional verbiage that I would like to clear up. Please do. Ariel and Eric obviously have a lot of challenges to their relationship. They are two different species. They come from two different worlds. There's an enigma surrounding their understanding of each other's world. There's this fascinated enigma surrounding the human world for Ariel. She is collecting thingamabobs that she doesn't even know what they're called or what they're for, and she's getting a very false interpretation from her friend Scuttle. (laughs) who assigns whimsical names to these objects because he's just making it up as he goes along because he loves Ariel's enthusiasm and he wants to keep it going. I like his names better. I like them too. It's a tingle hopper. Multi-purpose tool. And there's a lot of enigma surrounding Eric's perception of Ariel's world. He doesn't even know that she's actually a mermaid from the start of their relationship. He doesn't realize that she's not always going to be a human she will turn back into a mermaid in a few days if you don't kiss the girl (laughs) so that's a problem but we applaud him for being respectful towards her a lot of the issue that people have with ariel is they assume that she only wants to be a human to get the guy however if you pay close attention to that famous song, Part of Your World, and the first time she sings it at the very beginning of the film, she does not say part of your world. She sings part of that world. Meaning, until she meets and falls in love with Eric, she doesn't associate the human world and this desire to be part of it with him. It's just an inherent desire within her and a curiosity that is manifesting itself over years of her life. This collection is not brand new. Her grotto is full of years and years of collections. And then she meets Eric, and the first time she sees him, he's having fun. He's enjoying his life. He's playing this instrument that's making this beautiful sound. She loves music. She's been raised on music. She's a singer. Her whole family loves music. If you've seen the prequel to The Little Mermaid, you know that her mother loved music. That playfulness resonated with her a lot. When the time came to give her voice to Ursula in exchange for human legs, that wasn't an easy decision for her. I mean, she literally had this moment where she was like, I'll never see my father or my sisters again. That's a huge sacrifice. And I think she probably had this hope that, you know, things would work out because when you have a dream that big, you just kind of have this inherent knowing that things will work out eventually. But she still knew she was making a sacrifice. And then when she got to the human world, she wasn't able to speak with Eric. So for three days, she's trying to deepen this relationship and get him to kiss her so she can remain human. And of course, we all know that that doesn't work out and that there's a bit of a struggle. But I think it's out of that struggle that Eric really realizes what he has in her because he had heard her voice and was constantly chasing after this voice that he didn't have a face to assign it to, not knowing that it was Ariel the whole time. But it was when he realized he was about to lose Ariel to Ursula that he fought for her vanquished Ursula and realized no this is what I wanted it was in front of me the entire time and I think the Broadway musical does a really good job of kind of conveying the depth if anyone's ever seen or heard the music from the Broadway show even if you've never seen the show 
go listen to the music there is a song called if only oh i love that it makes me cry every time it's a quartet between ariel eric king triton and sebastian ariel's like if only you could know the things i long to say i think it does a really good job of helping us to realize what ariel and eric's deep desires are and she just wants him to know that it's her that this person he's pining after is her and she doesn't know how to express it to him and ultimately she's able to but in that time when they aren't able to speak to each other that's a huge challenge so they were relying on body language and haptics and there's a song in the broadway musical called one step closer where eric is teaching ariel how to dance on her human legs and it's the sweetest thing in the whole world she's kind of struggling to get it he literally has a line where he goes it's the way your feet smile or laugh and it's true there are so many ways aside from what we say to indicate how we feel I think in showing Ariel how exciting and enchanting the human world is she's even more attracted to his spirit because they both have this zest for life and this playfulness and adventure and of course they both love the sea Ariel risks everything to be part of the human world but also to be part of Eric's world and Eric risks everything to be with Ariel at the end, but also to build a different, more exciting life for himself because at the beginning of the film, he's kind of stuck in this mundane entrapment of I have to do all these royal things and obligations and the humdrum of the everyday routines that he's just kind of tired of and he wants some excitement and adventure and Ariel really shows him what life could be like with that. So I think they bring out that spirit in each other and they really set it free given all the challenges that they had to overcome I imagine that now their life would be full of spontaneity and fun and music and dancing and light what a fun couple yeah so much depth as deep as the ocean wow Her- Ursula took my voice I don't even know I'm speechless it was so beautiful wow <laughs> All right, so moving on to our next Disney couple. So these two actually are fighting probably for my first place between Aladdin and Jasmine and them. What? Which I know is very shocking, but I'm very passionate about this couple. It's Anna and Kristoff from Frozen. Anna, of course, is the princess of Arendelle who was shut out by her sister as a child, Elsa. While Elsa was instructed to hide these powers, Anna was someone who had a very pure heart, a spunky personality, and someone who always longed for genuine human connection. So Kristoff, on the other hand, was an ice salesman who was raised by trolls, not by humans. <laughs> <laughs> his best friend is Sven the reindeer. Kristoff did not have much human interaction, so I'm sure you could imagine his hesitancy, but also his excitement when he started to become closer to Anna in Frozen 1. So although Princess Anna was previously engaged to Prince Hans of the Southern Isles, who ultimately betrayed her, Kristoff was the one who went on the entire adventure with Anna to go save her sister. And they both developed feelings for each other. And although it was the sister's true love instead of the romantic true love that broke Anna's ice curse, Kristoff and Anna's love and relationship is nothing but pure and true. Anna is loyal almost to a fault. She is determined to protect her loved ones, especially her sister Elsa. But she will literally go to the ends of the earth and put herself in grave danger to protect the people she loves. Anna also has a desire to love and to be loved. Anna has a great quality, playfulness. She is spunky and fun and just has a fantastic personality. She is extremely brave and courageous. For example, when she lost everything, she, she knew she had to just keep moving forward when she's saying, do the next right thing. And when the screen like pans around her with the mountain view and she's basically facing one of the hardest moments of her life you can't help but feel inspired she's a really strong character Kristoff on the other hand I think my favorite quality of Kristoff is that he just shows up something I really love about him is that he gives his partner space to truly be herself he lets her deal with her sister stuff he's just supportive something else he does is he is able to give patience and grace to Anna when her insecurities arise. Like when she's like, you think I'm crazy? <laughs> he just kind of like brushes it off. He doesn't really give her backlash on that. He's just like, huh, I just love you. Like, yeah, you're crazy, but you're my crazy, <laughs> you know? When tensions arise in Frozen 2 and they get split up in the Enchanted Forest, he doesn't hold a grudge at all. Like he just lets things be and he stepped up when it was his time. One of the two favorite quotes I have from Frozen 2, he tells her, my love isn't fragile. Like, ooh, 
His love is not dependent on circumstances. It's just solid and it's there and it's not going anywhere regardless of what's going on situationally. Kristoff is just someone you can trust and rely on and again, makings of a fantastic partner. He shows up when his partner needs him the most, but he doesn't come to save the day. He shows up to help and work together with her and She's in the middle of a mission, but he'll take her where she needs to go. He'll push her forward. He'll tag team it with her. And that's my other favorite quote moment when he says, I'm here. What do you need? Yes. I love it. I think Anna and Kristoff have such a sweet relationship. They're companions and they can count on each other and they fill a place in each other's hearts that was yearning for genuine love for a very long time. Although Anna was previously with Hans, if you could even count that as a relationship, you can really feel the innocence of Anna and Kristoff's relationship. It's their first real love, their first real (laughs) relationship. I think some challenges and adversity they face and how they overcame it, the two of them definitely have a small period of disconnect in Frozen 2, which was very interesting, and I didn't anticipate that when going into the movie. Alexa, play Lost in the Woods. <laughs> oh, Lost in the Woods is a phenomenal song, by the way. I hope you all um, are fans of 80s ballads, because I didn't anticipate yes. that going into the movie either. In the second movie, Kristoff wants to propose to Anna so badly. I think he almost was dealing with that worthiness we were talking about for Aladdin. Like, he's viewing her as a princess, and... He just wants to make her happy and she's so wrapped up in everything with Elsa that she just keeps getting frustrated with him and her own insecurities flare up. They didn't hold grudges. They came together when it was necessary and they faced conflict head on. Everything really worked out because they were dedicated and loyal to each other. Anna just has a lot going on between reestablishing the relationship with her sister in the first movie and then trying to save Arendelle and Elsa in the second movie. And you can see Anna go through so much emotional turmoil. Like her whole demeanor really changes from the first movie to the second. Kristoff is really a perfect partner for her because he's kind hearted and he's very adaptable. And he may not be 100% involved with every single thing that's going on all of the time, but he will show up and be there for her. And then Anna in return supplies him with an abundance of love and gives him a sense of family and belonging. When he says... My love isn't fragile. Every woman in the theater was giving him a standing ovation. That does really connect with what you were saying about it being like a modern day relationship. No one has an emotional connection with Snow White's Prince because that that film was a fairy tale. That film was like, and then the prince comes and we all live happily ever after. This is real life. Mm -hmm. Anna's going through some real stuff here. And she needs someone who, like you said, will help alongside her, but isn't trying to be the hero and save the day and take the glory. And I think when your pet loves your human, (laughs) you've got a good thing going there Sven loves Anna you know Anna has this idea of what the world could be and she she's very idealistic and he is like in awe of her good intention and how pure her heart is and I think he mirrors her playfulness when he's with Sven and he's doing the voice of Sven (laughs) Sven give me a snack when he does that she it shows us that he's just as playful as She is, and she shows him, again, like we were saying, that allowance for him to be who he really is. They're each other's perfect compliment. Yeah. I think. I really think so. And she keeps Kristoff on his toes, too, so their relationship is very dynamic. But I think my favorite line, probably in that whole movie, is when she's, like, trying to get to the cliff to tell them to break the dam, and he shows up when the giants are chasing her, and he's just like, I'm here. What do you need? (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, wow. And that's not... To say he's, like, at her beck and call all the time. He's not. He has his own life. Just, I'm in it with you. What do you need? And he (laughs) trusts on his instinct to know that whatever she tells him is going to be for the benefit of everyone. And she's not going to ever act out of selfishness or for selfish gain. So, on to our final choice. A great choice. A great choice. One of my favorite Disney couples. And... Aside from the two gals I spoke about earlier, my favorite Disney princess, Tiana and Prince Naveen. Of (laughs) Maldonia. Thank you for the accent. I see a lot of myself in Tiana and I think this relationship resonated with me because I have so much of Tiana's incessant need to be productive to a fault. Tiana and Naveen are very different people. They come from completely different backgrounds. They come from different countries. They come from different socioeconomic backgrounds. When Tiana initially (laughs) meets Naveen, he's a frog. 
once she also becomes a frog and they are spending time together trying to figure out how to become a human again and she has these initial thoughts and reactions to who he is because you can't go off of looks when you're a frog. Again, seeing someone for who they are on the inside. Do you notice there's a theme here? But she's frustrated by his worldview because she sees him as lazy and entitled and motivated and kind of out of touch with the way the rest of the world works. She is someone who works all the time, seven days a week, doesn't take a break, and her burnout and inevitable exhaustion is causing her to project that frustration on him. Not necessarily out of envy, because I don't think Tiana would ever be happy living a life like that. She works so hard for her dreams and just doesn't stop, so she doesn't allow herself to have fun and enjoy her life because she's constantly so forward-reaching. Obviously, their plot challenges are we need to become humans again and mm. get back to Nolans, but <laughs> the challenges they face are mostly to do with kind of meeting in the middle, kind of trying to understand where the other person's coming from and empathize with them. And I think that doesn't really happen until Tiana learns more about Naveen's childhood and his upbringing. And the reason he doesn't have skills and he's lazy and unmotivated is because nobody took the time to invest in him as a person. And Tiana was the first person to really do that. She taught him how to mince mushrooms. He was kind of shaky and unsure at first and she kind of like guided his hand and he realized like, oh, I can do this. And I think just that little vote of confidence helped him to realize the value of hard work and that learning a new skill isn't just useful, but it's valuable and it adds value to who you are. And then in turn, Naveen helps Tiana to realize that she needs to let loose a little, that life without fun, without adventure and play is not really a life at all. She is a creative person. We know this. She's a chef. That's a very creative undertaking. So we know she has a creative spirit and a creative soul. And the product is delicious. And the product is delicious. <laughs> Naveen just really calls that out of her it's good to work and be productive but you need balance and I think the two of them help each other learn what balance looks like although they come from completely different worlds that's kind of where they establish their common ground and if it weren't for their time as frogs they probably would have never been able to do that um at the beginning of the film Tiana and her mother are taking that trolley ride home from Lottie's house to their home and you just watch the homes go from these big mansions to these little tiny homes but there's a warmth that grows as those homes get smaller and then they get home and Tiana starts shouting to the neighbors oh I made a pot of gumbo everybody come over and the whole neighborhood gets together and enjoys a meal together and there's this community they let those walls come down and Tiana's dad was an example of someone who knew how to work hard but who knew how to value and put the time and heart into what was really important. So I think Naveen reminded her of that which was already in her. It's a good lesson that money and status and ethnicity and all of those things don't matter. At the end of the day, what matters is who you are, who the other person is, and what magic happens when those two things collide. Just going back to what you were saying about Naveen and never no one ever really getting to know him for who he was. The fact that Tiana did that and she gave him a space to be vulnerable and him giving her permission to have fun, welcoming her into a space of the potential for love for the first time in her life because she finally took the time out of her busy schedule to, you know, connect with another human being. Their story is incredible. I'm so happy that they ended up being frogs because everything happens for a reason. We're and staying frogs, right? <laughs> and that was their reason. And it ended up working out wonderfully. So if you guys ever turn into frogs, I hope it works out wonderfully <laughs> for you too. <laughs> this was such a fun episode. I hope you guys enjoyed our analysis. We would love it if you would let us know if you want us to do another part in sort of like a mini series of this so if you want us to do an episode where we talk about non princess disney couples maybe some pixar couples oh maybe or like some, the animals maybe some cute disney animal couples <laughs> maybe some marvel and star wars there's just a lot of possibility within this topic send us a dm if you would like to hear more from this series you can find us on Instagram at jessicafay508 and at positively.kristen. You can leave a review on this episode on Apple Podcasts 
and let us know if you'd like a part two of this series there. We read every DM and every comment and every review. We would love to hear from you. And we appreciate them all too. Yes. Thank you for listening and we'll talk to you again next Tuesday. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Rediscover. Please subscribe and leave us a review wherever you're listening. Your reviews are what keep us going and we'd love to hear from you. Join us every Tuesday for a new conversation and let us know what you think we should talk about next. Follow us on Instagram at positively.kristen and at jessicafay508. And check out Jess's blog at theroadjesstraveled with one L.com. Until next time, stay frumpy.